Welcome to the live demonstration portion of our presentation. I'm Alan Cowles. For this demonstration, we're gonna be using a couple of different OpenShift clusters. We've got two deployed in AWS alongside one that's a bare metal cluster in our lab in Raleigh. So throughout this demo, I'm gonna be bouncing back and forth through a couple of windows, but I'll announce uh, when I'm doing that. And uh, with that brief intro, let's go ahead and get started here. So the first task I wanna demonstrate is we wanna show how users access controls roles groups are all configured for container environments. So OpenShift, um, one of our primary benefits is that we have built-in RBAC controls for users and groups. And here in the console, it's pretty easy to take a look at that. Under the user management tab, we have our users and groups. We have service accounts you can set up for specific projects, as well as roles and role bindings to grant permissions to those groups. When it comes to the types of authentication available. If we look under our administration and our CRDs, we'll have one for OpenShift authorization. I'm gonna scroll down to it real quick here. And under OAuth, you can create an instance for your cluster. And you can see the uh, users that I have right now are all defined using HTPass, but we have various authentication options, uh, Google credentials, Keystone, LDAP, uh, things like that. Now, when it comes to those users, I can take a look at them just by clicking on this in the window. And uh, we have our admin and we have a couple of generic users. Now, outside of creating users and their roles, one of the major benefits you get with OpenShift Platform Plus is Advanced Cluster Manager gives you the ability to create governance policies for those user accounts. So I've actually pulled up another window here for Advanced Cluster Manager, and it's showing our AWS cluster. And these governance policies, I've actually created one for access controls that limits the number of cluster admins we can have in the cluster. So showing how easy it is to make a modification to one of these users, we'll take user one and we're going to edit the user real quick. And I mentioned the role bindings earlier. We're going to take a cluster role binding for this user and we want to make them a cluster admin. As the administrative user, this is something I can do. But once we have created them as a cluster admin, we have our screen over here in ACM, which is showing us that right now all three of our clusters are healthy. And oh, nope, one of our clusters now has a violation. And that violation is our AWS cluster, and it's our cluster admin um, that has triggered. So that gives us a nice segue into the next task about container security runtimes. So security is a huge part of OpenShift uh, from Red Hat Core OS as an immutable operating system to um, SE Linux being native on all of our Node OSs. We also offer a product called Advanced Cluster Security for Kubernetes, which is also part of OpenShift Platform Plus. And Advanced Cluster Security gives you the ability to see you know, policy violations in your environment, images that you are currently using that have critical CVEs or important CVEs that need to be addressed, um, the oldest images in your environment, and then which of your deployments currently have problems. I mean, right now, the Visa processor one doesn't look very healthy, and that's, that's something we all probably need to worry about there. So one thing you can do is we could take a look at our violations, and we see that they trigger. Now, by default, most of our violations are set to inform. And, and the reason for that is simply a lot of the things you'll see in a violation, let's say, execing into a pod or port forwarding out of a pod, um, those could just simply be a dev doing some troubleshooting for the application they're writing. But we're, we're going to simulate that right now. Um, so I've got a little shell script I'm going to run for my ACS demo. And this is going to create a runtime event where it tries to do a port forward out of a pod. And what we should see is as this is running, we should see, yep, right here. So our Kubernetes actions port forward to pod on the Atlas pod has now um, shown up as an inform event. If we would actually like to see this be something that we could uh, block, we can actually do that with advanced cluster security for Kubernetes. We can jump down in our policy management and we can find that policy in specifics. Um, so here's our Kubernetes action port forward to pod and let's edit that policy. And the main tab here for our policy behavior, we wanna actually inform and enforce and enforce that on runtime when it happens. So once that policy has been updated, 
we can rerun our shell script and we'll see something different here. So we're gonna rerun this. We're gonna see immediately the Kubernetes action has now been blocked. We also see that the connection was refused when attempting to exploit the deployment. So that's just another one of the benefits of OpenShift Platform Plus with advanced cluster security for Kubernetes, you know, blocking a runtime security uh, violation. Uh, with that, we're done with our section one. So we're gonna move on to section two. Uh, so task 2A, uh, we want to show how operators and developers can manage integrated image registries and integrate third-party images into a project. So a neat way to show this, actually, is for us to honestly just list the images that are available in our cluster. So I'm going to close this window back down, and I'm going to go back to our home screen here in our AWS cluster. With our console, we can just say OC get images. And a cool thing here that we can see is all the images that are available for us to build from and the registries that's currently hosting those images. And you know, by default, OpenShift comes with uh, registry.redhat.io, we come with quay.io. Um, but users can also set up private registries. Uh, for example, for this image uh, being used in the ODS application, we have the image registry uh, being held as a local service internally. So it's, it's very possible for users to both create local or private registries as well as use public registries of images. A handy way to also do uh, tasks with various images is to leverage image streams. So one thing that I wanna show off here is I'm gonna pop into my demo project. And I've, if you've noticed, I've switched over to developer mode. So as a developer, this is what normally those user one, two, and three users would see. We have the ability to import a repo from Git. Uh, we have uh, the ability to pull those images from any image registry or image stream tag that already exists. But for the purposes of demonstration, I'm actually going to use the developer catalog and just show how quickly I can deploy a database um, picking on MariahDB but we're just gonna throw this up as a template and you'll actually see that the version of the image is defined as the 10.3 uh, Enterprise Linux 8 version. And we're just gonna go ahead and create that real quick. Now, this is gonna scale up from zero to one pods momentarily, but once it does, one thing we can do to maintain these image is the concept of an image stream and the tag. So when the pod is up and running, we can actually go in and edit this deployment config. And we'll see that the image stream from MariahDB has the tag on that version of the image we used. But using an image stream, we can actually update this to the latest tag. That way, when a new image is made available in one of our repositories, it will automatically update that backing image for our deployment. And this is very handy from a security context as well. If you noted some of the violations that we were seeing in the ACS screen, we're all about how old uh, images were currently in use in the system. But once we do that, we'll actually see the pod spin back down to zero and spin back up using that latest image tag. The next task we want to cover is we wanna show the built-in operators. Now, operators have been a fundamental part of OpenShift 4 since it was released. I'm gonna clear the screen here, but we have cluster operators which bring management functionality away from the core of OpenShift itself uh, into the individual operators. It, it helps make OpenShift more modular and easier to manage. So looking at the built-in cluster operators, we can do OC get CO for cluster operators. And we can see that these are, you know, we have operators for authentication, for bare metal resources, for CSI snapshots, for our image registries, as we just mentioned, for networking. So it helps, um, extract these services out of the main OpenShift package, makes them easier to control, they can be upgraded individually, and they manage the life cycle of those resources. Now, in addition to the cluster operators, um, there are operators available in what we call the operator hub for users to use. Now, the operator hub is available in the UI here, and it's a collection of operators for extended services or applications provided by Red Hat, Red Hat partners, or even the community. And we're gonna take a look at one right now. So Grafana, for example. 
Grafana is available as a community operator. Now we click on it, it does pop us up a little thing showing us that it is a community operator and to be aware of Red Hat support policy when using a community operator. But we're gonna continue and we're just gonna install this. We're gonna set this in our demo namespace. So we're gonna install Grafana, okay? And it just shows you know, how easy it is to install an operator out of the operator hub. You can see the steps it takes while it's creating that. And then it makes it really easy using the operator to actually extend the functions of the Grafana app by creating, you know, importing data sources, by actually creating customized graphs, things of that nature, which are very useful um, once you have a production environment running. So data sources, dashboards, um, Grafana itself notifications. These can all be set up to build on to the default functionality that we see in OpenShift. Moving on to our next task, um, we're actually going to have to bring up our bare metal cluster that's here in the Raleigh lab. And uh, that one's here. And you can see that we have virtualization available on this system. But our task here is to you know, have two clusters, and one of which is going to have an existing application from the integrated registry in a container, and one is going to have an application uh, in a VM instance. And so this third party application we've chosen to use is the Apache web server, which is going to make it nice and easy uh, to show off in this demo with the time that we have here. So in project web server, I'm going to create a virtual machine. And the VM I'm going to create, I'm going to do a CentOS machine. It's nice and easy. It's right up front. We're going to customize this machine. And the way we're going to customize it is uh, in its YAML. We're going to look at that first, and under the labels, we're going to create a label for app. Makes it easier for us to locate this later. The app is Apache. Okay, so we're going to save that. And then we're also going to come over and look at the cloud init script that we used for uh, creating the virtual machine. And part of that is we're going to tell it to install Apache for us. And we're also going to tell it to make sure that the web server and its services are running by default. Uh, so we need to know a couple of our, um, you know, Linux command line stuff here. But sys control enable HTTP/d.service and system control uh, start HTTP/d.service. So once we have this edit to our cloud and its startup script, we can go ahead and create a virtual machine. Now, went through a couple of steps here to get that up and running. We're going to pop back over to our CLI quickly. Um, and uh, we're going to clear our screen off. And in a container environment, it's a little bit easier to actually do what we just did. So we're going to actually do OC um, new app HTTPD in the web server namespace that I also have on this other cluster. So I'm going to do that. You can see the VMs coming up in the background here. And we can see that Apache 2.4 is now up and running. The application is currently not exposed. So it comes up with a service by default, but there's no route there. Um, now we're going to go ahead and do OC expose service HVD namespace web server. And that route's going to be created. So what we can do is over here in our AWS cluster, we can switch our project to web server, see the workloads that are available. And we see that's our HTTP pod. And we can drop down to our networking and see that service that was created and the route. And just click out. We should have the Red Hat Enterprise Linux test page for Apache. Shows the web servers up and running. Over in our bare metal lab, we can actually go and take a look at it. Now, notice the service did not come up by default. That's the reason I created that application tab earlier. So I'm going to create a service, and the name of this service is going to be Apache. And this is what we're using that app tag. So Apache right here. And of course, we're just creating a service to do external port 80 to port 80, the web server port. So with this service up, we can now create a route and we'll call that web server and the service is that Apache service we just created and target port 80 and we're going to create that and now with this up 
we can click and now we see the Apache server test page on our CentOS VM. So it shows that the same um, application can be installed in a container and in a VM and easily made available uh, to the public, but um, also that the process is very different uh, for each of those things. So now we want to move on to our next task in section three, which is to show how human operators can customize metrics and monitor dashboards. So this is uh, something else. I'm going to just pop up to the uh, AWS system for again. Quite easily, actually, we can um, see that there is an observe section built into OpenShift. Now, observe has several subsections. Alerting is one. And you can see now there's a lot of alerts here. This is just a demo system we've set up uh, for the purposes of this. But you can see that those are available there. You've also got the ability to do custom metrics. And the custom metrics can actually, um, you can write pretty uh, advanced queries to show you. I'm just going to do a simple one to just show how you can do a custom one real quick. So something that we might be interested in is how about our node health for memory? And let's see how much free memory we have. OK, so. Uh, and you notice it kind of guides you along with uh, tasks. So I want to look at mem free bytes, right? And we're just going to run that query. And suddenly we get a graph of all six nodes in our system. Now, these are our three control plane nodes. I can turn those off just by clicking on them. And you can actually see that of our three worker nodes here, two of them kind of low on the free memory, but this guy's just hanging out in you know right field waiting for somebody to hit him the ball. Uh, so he's just kind of chilling over there. But that shows just a simple example of how you can create a custom graph, custom dashboard. Um, there are default dashboards built into the observation channel too. So this is you know API requests most recently. There's uh, etcd requests and how they're running. Um, you know any number of information that's already available to you here in default dashboards. You also have the ability to see the API targets that are available for observation. Now, these come in handy if we were to go ahead and configure a tool like Grafana or a tool like Splunk that could kind of scrape the metrics off. If we want to you know, craft um, warning our own alert systems or our own um, dashboards and stuff external to OpenShift defaults. But just kind of showing that those are available and uh, how they work. So one thing. We're going to move on to our next task here, and it actually requires me to change my authentication over to our bare metal server where our VM is running. Because what we want to do here is we want to kill this VM and show how uh, it behaves. So with the VM running in the virtualization menu, you'll actually see that we have a live streaming event console. We also have a diagnostic screen that shows you know, the VM is currently ready. It can be live migrated, things like that. So I'm actually going to copy the login command here. that lets me have console access to this environment. And with that, I should be able to let's see, get pods in our web server environment. And we'll see it is our VM pod. So I kind of want to make sure I've got this diagnostic screen up when I do this, because what I'm going to do is OC delete pod server and let's copy that pod name. Okay, now a couple of things are going to happen here. First, this pod is controlled by deployment. So as soon as I delete it, it's going to redeploy. It's just resilient that way. Uh, but we're going to delete it. We're going to instantly see that the readiness is false. If we come over to our events, we will see that the machine, the virtual machine has been stopped because it was deleted. But then now it has been started back. Uh, the number of times that log has happened. Um, we can also see this in our ongoing activity log where the virtual machine was deleted, the new, and then the container for the virtual machine was recreated. The Ethernet interfaces were added. You can see all of this information right here in the ongoing activity log. With that, we're going to move along to our last two tasks. And I'm not trying to confuse us in our order here, but there's a lot of overlap in these two. We're going to show how operators in the term of people can achieve usage metering, cost monitoring, reporting. Uh, we've also got you know key features in addressing quota governance, cost forecasting, and optimization. And to do this, um, we have a product 
if you see, notice these clusters actually show insights recommendations are active. Red Hat Insights actually reports back from OpenShift clusters to the Red Hat Hybrid Cloud Console. And in that Hybrid Cloud Console, we have tools for cost management. Now in cost management, we can see various options. We see what projects are costing us the most amount of money. We can see which clusters are costing the, the amount of money they are. We can change this to different currencies. We can split it out uh, to infrastructures. So we can show you know, what our AWS environment is showing us. We can show what's going on in our Azure environment. We can filter it by OpenShift running in those environments and show us that you know, as a result of OpenShift in AWS, EC2 is actually the, the top uh, cost here for us. And then our subscriptions for RHEL 7 and RHEL 8 are the next two. We can split it out from the instance usage, storage services, and network costs. We have the ability to do a cost explorer, which shows us daily costs and what each item is costing each day. With that, we can pick you know, a specific task, let's say OpenShift, and we can create reports by exporting the daily or monthly aggregate, create a CSV file that can be imported and looked at for any type of reporting. We also have the ability to uh, click on this question mark here for API documentation. And under cost management for API, there is a public API that you can scrape for cost management. And here are the different API requests you can use. But it gives you the ability to set up your own monitoring tools for cost management outside of the HCC service. Returning to the main window, we want to show how we can do cost forecasting. And that's actually on our front graph here. So let me hop back into cost management and that overview. And what we actually see is the costs we see right now. We can see the cost of the current month, June 1st to the 22nd. We can see the cost of the previous month, May 1st to the 31st. And we can see a projected forecast with the different, uh, the lighter green line, uh, what we're expecting. We also have a cost confidence cone. Okay, so it's gonna, it's gonna be somewhere in this range. Now, outside of that, uh, we have asked to talk about a couple of key features, quota governance and cost optimization. Quota governance is something that is currently roadmapped. Uh, we do not currently have the ability to, let's say set a quota for a certain spend and cut it off at that moment. Uh, but, you know, using the information provided in the reporting tools in the cost explorer, you can see what projects, and what applications are incurring those costs and easily split those out. And then cost optimization. Now, that's something it's, it's a little more, you know, roadmapped, but it's ready to go. So you see this preview button up here. We can actually click this and turn on our preview mode and you can actually see that optimizations is now available in the menu. So that is an upcoming feature. Uh, but while I've got a minute here, I just kind of wanted to show it to you. So it's going to look at some of our clusters. I'm going to pick one of these actions here, but it kind of shows you like, for example, you can optimize the manager deployment. Currently, you're requesting 100 megabytes of memory, but it only needs 37. So you could change your memory request in that deployment and save yourself some memory there. Same thing. The current limit is set to 300, but you only need 37. So why did you set your limit so high? These are some ways that you can optimize. So the Grafana application that's running here, the CPU seems uh, it's, it's asking for 0.1 core, but recommended is 0.01 cores. The memory it's currently asking for 256 megabytes, but recommended is 72 megabytes. So you can use these optimizations and um, save yourself some cost in the future.